Okay, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, today is February 22, 2021. The Feast of the Chair of Peter, the Apostle. So we are celebrating a very nice feast, commemorating the time that our Lord appointed Peter to be his vicar on earth. So the church has been celebrating this uh, particular feast since the 4th century. Okay. It has been a long established tradition to honor uh, the chair of Peter. The, um, the chair, which is a symbol for the authority of Peter and his teaching authority and his governing authority for the, the whole church. Our Lord left uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven and entrusted the, uh, the whole church being built upon the rock, the rock that was Peter. Okay. Uh, and here we're going to hear how that happened. So in today's gospel, we're reading from uh, the gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. We recall the exact time at which our Lord uh, commissioned Peter to be the head of the church. So it goes, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Sorry, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Very, very beautiful, powerful um, gospel that uh, tells us many things. And we could, we could uh, glean many, many lessons from this particular gospel of today. Um, first of which is... The, the revelation that uh, came through the answer of Peter with a question, who do you say that I am? It was only he who was able to give any answer at all. The apostles were dumbfounded, perhaps, with the, with the question. They didn't know, you know how to reply to that. Right? But as our Lord himself said, the answer of Peter was not something that flesh and blood revealed to him. In other words, he didn't make it up, right? That the answer of Peter was a revelation from God the Father. It was an answer inspired by grace as a sort of a very clear sign to the rest of the apostles and to the rest of us to this day, that Peter was indeed chosen by God himself to head the church. So the institution of the papacy, okay, the Pope being 
the, the authority in the church, the teaching authority, the governing authority, the shepherd in the church was something we can see very clearly here that was established in the most supernatural of ways. It was a consequence of the revelation to Peter of not only the best answer he could give, but also the fact that among the 12, he was really the one chosen by uh, God to head the church. And he said, and our Lord promised, the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against my church. With the assurance of the Father's choosing of Peter comes also the assurance that Satan will have no power to destroy this church. And our Lord, after he resurrected, uh, reinforced that promise. I will give you the Holy Spirit. Right? Practically repeating what he told them here. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There are two ways to, to understand that. One is that that is also the origin of confession. But more than that, it is also the, the, uh, the uh, reinforcement of the teaching authority of the church. And Peter exercises that teaching authority through the symbol of the chair, the cathedra. Okay? That is why in the church we have that term, uh, ex cathedra, from the chair of Peter. He teaches and he uh, reinforces the faith of the rest of all of us in the church. So, our Lord, the head of the church, proceeded to appoint Peter to be his vicar, his visible representative on earth. That's what vicar of Christ on earth means. To authoritatively guide and govern the church of Jesus Christ. And he signifies that with a change of name. And that seems to have been the uh, tradition carried out in the church when somebody receives a special commissioning, a special mission, they change their names. Okay? Uh, this is something that you will see among religious uh, congregations, religious priests or nuns. Okay? That, and even the Pope, right? See, now you have the Pope Francis. He chose the name Francis uh, to refer to himself. They don't use their, their real names. Because that is coming from this tradition of our Lord himself, who changed the name of Peter. Okay? Sorry, changed the name of Simon to Peter, called him the rock upon which to build his church. And this Peter okay, and his successors um, are really the representatives of Jesus Christ on earth. Peter was the primus inter pares, as we say it in Latin, the first among equals. He was an apostle, just like all the twelve were, but he was given a special mission, a special authority <clears throat> to be the head of his co-equals, the other bishops within the church. The apostles were the first bishops. Peter was the first, you know, the primary bishop, so to speak. He was the bishop, up to now the bishop of Rome, and consequently the, the head of of the rest of the church. Whoever is the bishop of Rome is the head of the rest of the church. And uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great, uh, who reigned from the year 590 to 604, okay, the 6th century, uh, gave a, a, a different kind of a moniker to himself, which is now carried out through all uh, history by all popes. And they call themselves the servant of the servants of God. See? What a beautiful way of depicting uh, the role of the Pope among his fellow bishops and his brother bishops and priests in the church. Right, That he is a servant of who? The other servants. See? The servant of the servants of God. Now, in the Catechism, we read um, on point, in point, 
882 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. What does the Catechism say about the Pope? Okay. The Pope, Bishop of Rome and Peter's successor, is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity, both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. See, so he is the perpetual, meaning for all time, invisible, because, well, he is very much present among us. He is a live, human, breathing, red-blooded human being, okay? He's not some kind of a phantom of the imagination or, uh, you know, anything else. He, he is a real person that God has chosen, to be the head of the church and, and all of the successors down the line from Peter. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, has full, supreme, and universal power over the whole church. A power which can he can always exercise unhindered. So the Pope has a very, very big responsibility upon his shoulders. If you recall that other passage of the gospel after our Lord resurrected and he met them by the beach, right? Uh, he asked Peter on that occasion, Peter, do you love me more than these? Our Lord was trying to test Peter. Because this was, remember, after the resurrection, meaning after his denial of Jesus Christ, right? Which we are again going to hear about during this Lent. He denied Jesus three times. He repented for that big, 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 big mistake. And so our Lord wanted to test his resolve and asked him three times, Peter, do you love me more than these? And the first time he answered, yes, Lord. And he said, feed my sheep. Then again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? A third time. So Peter got already worried. Why is he asking me? Didn't he hear my answers the first two times? No, but our Lord used three questions to confirm. Do you love me? Do you really, really, sincerely love me? says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know all things. You know that I love you. And so I said again, feed my sheep. Or I don't know what the order is. Feed my lamb, feed my sheep. They were just the same, right? So Peter was given the very, very big, heavy responsibility of nourishing the faithful. With truth, with authentic Catholic teaching, and to preserve the legacy of Jesus Christ and the teaching of the Catholic Church all throughout the rest of history and the life of this world on earth that we have. And this is going to continue all the way to the end of the world. So Peter has a very, very big responsibility. Now, what does that what do we have to do about that responsibility of peter well we also have a responsibility towards peter okay. jesus gave peter and his successors a big burden a sweet but big burden to care for all of us the sheep now there is, uh, it's always a two-way street, right? It is always a two-way street. A relationship is always a two-way street. So we have to ask ourselves the question, well, what do we now have to do about Peter's responsibility towards us? How do we now reciprocate? How do we now relate to Peter, to the Pope? Well, our first responsibility is one of fidelity. We have to be faithful to the Pope 
Because being faithful to the Pope means being faithful to Jesus Christ. Remember that the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. Yeah. Right? So we have to be faithful to the Pope, faithful to the teachings of the Pope. Particularly, whatever he pronounces ex cathedra. Okay? Ex cathedra. With the full authority of the Church and Jesus Christ behind him. Our second responsibility is to pray for the Pope. We have to pray for the Pope. We have to mortify, offer sacrifices for the Pope, asking in turn for the Pope's fidelity to Jesus Christ, for the Pope's person, his good health, for the Pope's protection, for the Pope's untiring effort to continue teaching us and, and, and keeping the faith alive in us through his teaching, his good example, his advice. Okay? And we have to pray that he receives all the strength of mind and body and the health of his soul to continue caring for us, ministering for us, and fulfilling the commission that he received from Jesus Christ. Feed my sheep, feed my lamb. We have to, be, we, we have to pray that he continues to adhere and be faithful to the magisterium of the church. Fidelity to the teaching of the church and the teaching of the popes before him and the teaching of all the fathers of the church before him. And that responsibility which we have is not a small matter. Not a small matter. This is a very, very big and grave responsibility for each and every Catholic. In fact, it is so big and so, so important a responsibility that note that every time uh, we avail of an indulgence, particularly plenary indulgence, okay, one of the conditions to receive such an indulgence is to pray for the Pope. Okay? To pray for the Pope and his intentions. So that's only one way to demonstrate how grave and important our responsibility as faithful is to pray for the person and intention of the Pope. Okay? So let's, let us especially be reminded of that this time of Lent. And we will have plenty of opportunities this time of Lent to pray and mortify for the Pope. Okay? We have plenty of opportunities and we can offer up plenty of these opportunities, especially this time of Lent. Well, in, in the family, we, we, we do a lot of praying for the Pope. We, of course, offer the Mass uh, for, the, for the Pope. Uh, we, in our intentions for the Rosary, every day we pray for the Pope. And we offer up many other things all throughout the day for the person and intention of the Pope. Let us remember... Also, that the Pope is human. Okay? He is not Superman. He is not an angel. He is a man like us, given a special grace, of course, to carry out his mission. But he is still very much human. Therefore, he is subject to temptations. Therefore, he is subject to error. Right? Especially when talking about things that are a matter of opinion, he can always give opinions he's entitled to. And sometimes it may not be the right opinion. And we cannot completely fault him for that because, well, you know, as a human being, he has to process things intellectually. And sometimes he can err. Sometimes his opinion might not be as correct and as perfect as tradition would hold. And sometimes it does not it does not uh, 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 pass the test of uh, traditional uh, magisterium. And we can grant him that because sometimes that's all part of the exercise of trying to understand the great mysteries that Jesus Christ has left for us to try to understand. Okay, So we cannot fault the Pope for trying to 
give his opinions about things because that's perhaps his way also of trying to challenge the rest of the theologians around to try to go deeper in the understanding of the real teachings of Jesus Christ. Right? And that is why, with all the more reason, should we keep praying for the enlightenment of the Pope, for the grace to really understand what the Holy Spirit might be communicating to him and to the rest of the College of Bishops, okay? so that we be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Lord, I mean, uh, uh, the Pope deserves our prayers. The Pope deserves our sacrifices. The Pope deserves our love. If you recall, we were just listening to it yesterday, right? When he was interviewed, Pope Francis was interviewed by a reporter. And he was asked, who is Jorge Bergoglio? And what was his answer? You remember? What was his answer? Huh? I am a sinner. Right? I am a sinner was his most humble reply. I am a sinner. And so, by his own admission, he is a sinner who needs prayers, who needs our help. Right? That's a very humble expression from the Pope himself. The Pope, not only Francis, but all other Popes, have been beggars of prayers. They have always begged us, the faithful, to pray for them. Let's do our part. Let's do our duty to always pray for the Pope and mortify for the Pope. Offer mortification and sacrifices for the Pope, the Vicar of Christ on earth. That is one of the best ways we can show our love and affection for the Pope and for our Lord himself. Okay. Okay. That's it for us, folks. Have a good day, everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. Uh, Eva is saying goodbye. goodbye. Eva, are we going to say goodbye over here, Eva? Come, come, come here. <laughs> She's busy taking notes. What are you writing there? Why don't you show us? Come here. Hmm? Why don't you show us what you're writing? Yeah, you say goodbye. Say bye-bye now. Uh-oh. <laughs> She's busy taking notes, you see? What are you doing there? You see, look. Hmm? Are those your notes? Are those your drawings? Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, everybody. See bye. you tomorrow. Bye-bye.